Hello, I'm Junie Ginsberg, and I'd like to tell you something about the place I call home. The city of New Babbage is an old one. Her bones creak with the weight of age, and she groans beneath the pain of progress. Generations have passed over her cobblestones, lost as they were in their own thoughts and dreams. Each citizen has had his or her own aim, be it wealth or fame, adventure or love. They have lived out heady aspirations of industry, science, influence, and sometimes vengeance. Our city, in a tangle of grit and determination, has a beauty all its own, sewn together by people in equal parts brilliance and madness. It is to the bones of these tenacious souls that New Babbage clings, and as they rest secure in her dirt, it is said their spirits can sometimes be still no more in death than in life. It is for this reason that when the days grow short and shadows grow long, when a chill settles dark upon the pavement, Babbagers give cemeteries a wider berth. Even the most rational among us has seen sights a bit unusual within the walls of the city. What follows here is a tale that could have grown from New Babbage's own unforgiving earth, a story of bones that could not rest. The Man of Science by Jerome K. Jerome I met a man in the Strand one day that I knew very well, as I thought, though I had not seen him for years. We walked together to Charing Cross, and there we shook hands and parted. Next morning, I spoke of this meeting to a mutual friend, and then I learnt for the first time that the man had died six months before. The natural inference was that I had mistaken one man for another. An error that, not having a good memory for faces, I frequently fall into. What was remarkable about the matter, however, was that throughout our walk, I had conversed with the man under the impression that he was the other dead man, and, whether by coincidence or not, his replies had never once suggested to me my mistake. As soon as I had finished, Jeffson, who had been listening very thoughtfully, asked me if I believed in spiritualism to its fullest extent. Well, that is rather a large question, I answered. What do you mean by spiritualism to its fullest extent? Well, do you believe that the spirits of the dead not only have the power of revisiting this earth at their will, but that, when here, they have the power of action, or rather, of exciting to action. Let me put a definite case. A spiritualist friend of mine, a sensible and by no means imaginative man, once told me that a table, through the medium of which the spirit of a friend had been in the habit of communicating with him, came slowly across the room towards him of its own accord one night as he sat alone, and then pinioned him against the wall. Now, can any of you believe that, or can't you? I could, Brown took it upon himself to reply, but before doing so, I should wish for an introduction to the friend who told you the story. Speaking generally, he continued, it seems to me that the difference between what we call the natural and the supernatural is merely the difference between frequency and rarity of occurrence. Having regard to the phenomena, we are compelled to admit, I think it illogical to disbelieve anything we are unable to disprove. For my part, remarked McShaughnessy, I can believe in the ability of our spirit friends to give the quaint entertainments credited to them much easier than I can in their desire to do so. You mean, added Jeffson, that you cannot understand why a spirit, not compelled as we are, 
by the exigencies of society should care to spend his evenings carrying on a laboured and childish conversation with a room full of abnormally uninteresting people. That is precisely why I cannot understand, McShaughnessy agreed. Nor I neither, said Jeffson, but I was thinking of something very different altogether. Suppose a man died with his dearest wish of his heart unfulfilled. Do you believe that his spirit might have power to return to earth and complete the interrupted work? Well, answered McShaughnessy, if one admits the possibility of spirits retaining any interest in the affairs of this world at all, it is certainly more reasonable to imagine them engaged upon a task such as you suggest, than to believe that they occupy themselves with the performance of mere drawing room tricks. But what are you leading up to? Why, to this, replied Jeffson, seating himself straddle-legged across the chair and leaning his arms upon the back. I was told a story this morning at the hospital by an old French doctor. The actual facts are few and simple. All that is known can be read in the Paris police records of 62 years ago. The most important part of the case, however, is the part that is not known and never will be known. The story begins with a great wrong done by one man unto another man. What the wrong was, I do not know. I am inclined to think, however, it was connected with a woman. I think that because he who had been wronged hated him and who had wronged him with a hate such as does not often burn in a man's brain unless it be fanned by the memory of a woman's breath. Still, that is only conjecture, and the point is immaterial. The man who had done the wrong fled, and the other man followed him. It became a point-to-point -point race, the first man having the advantage of a day's start. The course was the whole world, and the stakes were the first man's life. Travellers were few and far between in those days, and this made the trail very easy to follow. The first man never knowing how far or how near the other man was behind him, and hoping now and again that he might have baffled him, would rest for a while. The second man, knowing always just how far the first one was before him, never paused. And thus, each day, the man who was spurred by hate drew nearer to the man who was spurred by fear. At this town, the answer to the never varied question would be, Oh, at seven o'clock last evening, monsieur. Seven. Ah, eighteen hours. Give me something to eat quick while the horses are being put to. At the next calculation would be sixteen hours. Passing a lonely chalet, Monsieur puts his head out of the window. How long since the carriage passed this way with a tall, fair man inside? Such a one passed early this morning, monsieur. Thanks. Drive on. A hundred francs apiece if you are enough to pass before daybreak. And what for the dead horses, monsieur? Twice their value in living. One day, the man, who was ridden by fear, looked up and saw before him the open door of a cathedral and, passing in, knelt down and prayed. He prayed long and fervently, for men, when they are in sore straits, clutch eagerly at the straws of faith. He prayed that it might be forgiven his sin and, more important still, that he might be pardoned the consequences of his sin and be delivered from his adversary. And a few cheers from him. Facing him, knelt his enemy, 
playing also. But the second man's prayer, being a thanksgiving merely, was short, so that when the first man raised his eyes, he saw the face of his enemy gazing at him across the chair tops with a mocking smile upon it. He made no attempt to rise, but remained kneeling, fascinated by the look of joy that shone out of the other man's eyes. And the other man moved the high back chairs one by one and came towards him softly. Then, just as the man who had been wronged stood beside the man who had wronged him, full of gladness that his opportunity had come, there burst from the cathedral tower a sudden clash of bells, and the man whose opportunity had come broke his heart and fell back dead, with that mocking smile still playing around his mouth. And so he lay there. Then the man who had done the wrong rose up and passed out, praising God. What became of the body of the other man is not known. It was the body of a stranger who had died suddenly in the cathedral. There was no one to identify it, no one to claim it. Years passed away, and the survivor in the tragedy became a worthy and useful citizen, and a noted man of science. In his laboratory were many objects necessary to him in his researches, and prominent among them stood in a certain corner a human skeleton. It was a very old and much mended skeleton, and one day the long expected end arrived, and it tumbled to pieces. Thus, it became necessary to purchase another. The man of science visited a dealer he knew well, a little parchment faced old man who kept a dingy shop. There was nothing ever sold within the shadow of the towers of Notre Dame. The little parchment-faced old man had just the very thing that Monsieur wanted, a singularly fine and well-proportioned study. It should be sent around and sent up in Monsieur's laboratory that very afternoon. The dealer was good as his word. When Monsieur entered his laboratory that evening, the skeleton was in its place. Monsieur seated himself in his high-backed chair and tried to collect his thoughts, but Monsieur's thoughts were unruly and inclined to wander, and to wander always in one direction. Monsieur opened a large volume and commenced to read. He read of a man who had wronged another and fled from him, the other man following. Finding himself reading this, he closed the book angrily and went and stood by the window and looked out. He saw before him the sun-pierced nave of a great cathedral, and on the stones lay a dead man with a mocking smile upon his face. Cursing himself for a fool, he turned away with a laugh, but his laugh was short-lived, for it seemed to him that something else in the room was laughing also. Struck suddenly still, with his feet glued to the ground, he stood listening for a while, then sought with starting eyes the corner from where the sound had seemed to come. But the white thing standing there was only grinning. Monsieur wiped the damp sweat from his head and hands and stole out. For a couple of days he did not enter the room again. On the third telling himself that his fears were those of a hysterical girl, he opened the door and went in. To shame himself, he took his lamp in his hand and, crossing over to the far corner where the skeleton stood, examined it. A set of bones bought for 300 francs. He was a child to be scared by such a bogey. He held his lamp in front of the thing's grinning head. The flame of the lamp flickered, as though a faint breath had passed over it. The man explained this to himself by saying that the walls of the house were old and cracked, and that the wind might creep in anywhere. 
He repeated this explanation to himself as he recrossed the room, walking backwards with his eyes fixed on the thing. When he reached his desk, he sat down and gripped the arms of his chair till his fingers turned white. He tried to work, but the empty sockets in that grinning skeleton head seemed to be drawing him towards them. He rose and battled with his inclination to fly screaming from the room. Glancing fearfully about him, his eye fell on a high screen, standing before the door. He dragged it forward and placed it between himself and the thing, so that he could not see it, not it see him. Then he sat down again to his work. For a while, he forced himself to look at the book in front of him, but at last, unable to control himself any longer, he suffered his eyes to follow their own bent. It may have been an hallucination. He may have accidentally placed the screen so as to favour such an illusion, but what he saw was a bony hand coming around the corner of the screen, and with a cry, he fell to the floor in a swoon. The people of the house came running in, and lifting him up, carried him out, and laid him upon his bed. As soon as he recovered, his first question was where they had found the thing. Where was it when they entered the room? And when they told him, they had seen it standing where it always stood, and had gone down to the room to look again because of his frenzied entreaties, and returned trying to hide their smiles. He listened to their talk about overwork and the necessity for change and rest, and said they might do with him as they would. So, for many months, the laboratory door remained locked. Then there came a chill autumn evening, when the man of science opened it again and closed it behind him. He lighted his lamp and gathered his instruments and books around him, and sat down before them in his high-backed chair, and the old terror returned to him. But this time, he meant to conquer himself. His nerves were stronger now, and his brain clearer. He would fight this unreasoning fear. He crossed to the door and locked himself in, and flung the key to the other end of the room, where it fell among jars and bottles with an echoing clatter. Later on, his old housekeeper, going her final round, tapped at his door and wished him good night, as was her custom. She received no response at first, and, growing nervous, tapped louder and called again, and at length an answering good night came back to her. She thought little about it at the time, but afterwards she remembered that the voice that had replied to her had been strangely grating and mechanical. Trying to describe it, she likened it to a voice as she would imagine coming from a statue. Next morning, his door remained still locked. It was no unusual thing for him to work all night and far into the next day, so no one thought to be surprised. When, however, evening came, and yet he did not appear, his servants gathered outside the room and whispered, remembering what had happened once before. They listened, but could hear no sound. They shook the door and called to him, then beat with their fists upon the wooden panels, but still no sound came from the room. Becoming alarmed, they decided to burst the door open, and after many blows, it gave way, and they crowded in. He sat bolt upright in his high-backed chair. They thought at first he had died in his sleep, but when they drew nearer and the light fell upon him, they saw the livid marks of bony fingers around his throat, and his eyes, there was a terror such as is not seen before in human eyes. Brown was the first to break the silence that followed. He asked me 
if I had any brandy on board. He said he felt he should like just a nip of brandy before going to bed. That is one of the chief charms of Jefferson's stories. They always make you feel you want a little brandy. As the chill of this story fades, perhaps you too would like to ponder its words over a snifter of brandy. Knowing now, as you do, about the restless souls on which New Babbage is built, perhaps you will also understand why we have more pubs than other cities. For when the work of the day is done, after the well-worn hammer has been laid down, we gather by the firelight to take solace in the company of our neighbors. Perhaps, too, we also wish to bolster our courage and postpone the bracing dread of night as we step outside the door to begin our long walks home. Tales from New Babbage, a series of classic short stories read by residents of New Babbage, a steampunk city. A Man of Science by Jerome K. Jerome was read by Victor Mornington, first published in September of 1892 in The Idler, an illustrated monthly of literature and humor published from 1892 to 1911 in Great Britain, and was brought to you by Old Doc Emerson's Scented Jungle Oils. Do you stink? Are you tired of smelling like a wingy fish left in the sweltering August sun? Are showers just not your thing? Old Doc Emerson's Scented Jungle Oils are just what you've been looking for. A pungent mixture of exotic fruits and flowers that will hide all evidence of hard work and poor hygiene. Sure, you might smell like a dandy, but one swig of old Doc Emerson's scented jungle oils and you won't give a fig what people think. And remember, if it's not old Doc Emerson's, then it's just scented oil, and you are a dandy. This episode of Tales from New Babbage was produced in September of 2012. For Radio Real under Creative Commons 3.0 Attribution. Non-commercial, share-alike license. All music was composed and played by Kevin McLeod and is available at Incompetech.com. You can download past episodes from our blog at talesfromnewbadage.blogspot.com. <laughs>